take a look at the components of the hydrological cycle. Now, you probably are familiar with these terms in some respect. You probably are very familiar with the water cycle in itself. So the actual components of the hydrological cycle begin with precipitation and we're going to then take a look at interception. We're going to take a look at that today. Evaporation and evapotranspiration. Infiltration and soil moisture and groundwater. Now remember this flowchart right here is exceptionally important for you to remember. So please take a look at it kind of memorize it and if you have questions definitely let me know in class. Alright, let's take a look specifically at our first component of the hydrological cycle which is precipitation. Now precipitation is a single input and there's only one input into the water cycle and this is a single input which includes all forms of rainfall, snow, frost, hail, or dew. So anytime we have input of precipitation in these forms, that's our first step. Now precipitation has very uh, local hydrological characteristics. So we have a couple here that are um, characteristics that affect local hydrology, basically meaning that it affects an, a local area. So the total amount of precipitation definitely will affect the hydrology in a particular area. If you have a lot of rainfall in one particular area or snowfall versus an area that does not have much at all. The intensity of this, of this precipitation. Is it a really high amount or a low amount during those times? Sometimes here in Florida we get really intense rains in the afternoon that only last about an hour versus those really long rainstorms that we also can sometimes have where it rains all day. The type of precipitation also will affect the local hydrology. Is it rainfall or is it snow? Maybe it's dew. The geographic distribution, meaning how kind of widespread it is. Now sometimes again, you can actually look down the street and it's really raining, but where you are is not. Now this is on a very local scale, but if you think more local, meaning like all of Sarasota or all of Sarasota County, those are the more what we're talking about, not so much just one street. And the variability also will affect the local hydrology. Maybe the variability meaning the type of rainfall. Uh, maybe we have snow or rain, frost, hail. We have all of that stuff versus just one type. Here in Florida, we tip typically just have one type. Uh, we have rain, but we can see hail sometimes during really massive thunderstorms and we do see a lot of dew especially when we have those um, high water content or a uh, high uh, relative humidity content. Now our second component of the water cycle is interception. Now interception is actually something that we don't normally talk about in the water cycle but it's extremely important to understand because interception is the water that is caught and stored by vegetation. So imagine, um, let's just say a forest because we see there's a lot of trees in a forest. Now as it rains, the leaves and some of the vegetation might trap some of that water in which the water does not make it completely to the ground. So in areas like rainforests, usually we have a lot of, of storing of the water in the leaves of those trees and rainforests. So in this picture it, it tries to show you how we have this one tree here and as it's raining the tree is sort of taking in all of that water. It's storing it either in the leaves, it's actually taking it in through the leaves and then it's going to store it down through its roots. Outside of this tree notice we have all of this rain but underneath the tree's leaves we're not really getting so much rain directly underneath that tree. It's usually being stored by that vegetation. So when talking about interception, we're really talking about three major components to it. We're talking about interception lost. Now, when we talk about this interception lost, we're talking about the water that is retained by plant surfaces. Later, that gets evaporated away in what's known as evapotranspiration. We're going to talk about that in the next slide. So interception loss deals with the water that's retained by the plant 
or which is later evaporated away, it might also be absorbed by the plant. Now depending upon what type of vegetation it is, maybe the amount, the vegetation density, or the rainfall intensity will depend upon how much interception loss we have here. So when talking about interception loss, it depends on those factors. Type of vegetation, vegetation density, and rainfall intensity. So just to give you a quick example, if we have a rainforest where we have many, many types of trees, many different types and lots of trees, just the t um, density of that vegetation is pretty large, then we're, we might see a lot more interception loss. Then let's say um, just outside your backyard where you probably have a few trees but not a horrible amount. So your interception loss outside in your backyard is going to be a lot less than, let's say, a portion of a rainforest. Another component of interception is called throughfall. Now you can kind of take apart this particular word and kind of understand the definition. So throughfall is the water that either falls through gaps in the vegetation or which drops from leaves, twigs, and stems. So in this little particular picture, this yellow portion here, all those little yellow portions, that's actually the throughfall. So it's the parts that actually will drip through the gaps from the leaves, the twigs, the stems, basically from that vegetation. The third component of interception is called stem flow. Now this is the water that will trickle along the twigs and the branches and then it's going to make its way down the main trunk. So again, in this picture, that's in red. So stem flow is, if you can imagine, all, these, um, all the stems and the branches of the tree kind of collecting that rainwater. It's going to drip down those tree trunks all the way down to the ground. So interception is the water that's caught or stored by vegetation with the three main components, interception loss, through fall, and stem flow. Our third component is evaporation. And uh, evaporation sort of broke down into a couple different portions. So in your notes, we have 3A, 3B, and 3C. We'll talk about all of those. So when talking about 3A, the third component of the water cycle is evaporation. Now this is the process by which a liquid or a solid is changed into a gas. So we see this an awful lot, um, let's say from a puddle, you're just walking around, you see the puddle, and as it evaporates, that water actually changes to a gas, something hopefully you learned in physical science. Now, evaporation will increase under warm, dry conditions. Now, since here in Florida we have very humid conditions, evaporation, especially in very humid days, actually does not happen an awful lot. Under drier circumstances, let's say in our dry period, in the winter months, we do see a lot of evaporation. And it's not as, well, we don't get as much rain either. Now evaporation will decrease under cold, calm conditions. So in areas, I don't want to say so much Florida, if we don't really have cold conditions. But in areas of cold, um, not so much um, precipitation during those time periods, we're going to see a decrease in evaporation. So just in Florida, we do see a decrease in de evaporation in our winter, in, I'm sorry, in our summer months because it's fairly wet in our air. That's what makes it so humid. So we have some factors that affect evaporation. And these include temperature, humidity, wind speed, uh, amount of available water, vegetation cover, and the color of a surface. We also have something called albedo. Now this is the reflectivity of a surface. So if something's really shiny, like if you have a very shiny car, it has a high albedo. If you have a very dull car, or something that's like, like the, um, sometimes the surface of your driveway tends to be pretty like dull and just not very shiny, that's a low albedo. So these factors affect evaporation. We have higher temperatures versus lower temperatures, high humidity versus low humidity. 
These are all going to affect the evaporation. Now here we talk about, again, the third part of the uh, third component of the hydrological cycle, talking about evaporation. But now we're going to get specific with specific parts of plants and things. So this is 3B, which is evapotranspiration. In your textbook and on your paper one, you'll be able to abbreviate evapotranspiration as all capitals, EVT. So if you see EVT, it means evapotranspiration. Now this is the combined effect of evaporation and transpiration, which happens in plants or in vegetation. So in essence, it's almost like the evaporation of water coming from the plants. If you will, a very um, rudimentary understanding of it, and please don't repeat this to anybody because this is not really what happens, but it's almost like the sweat of a plant. So imagine you sweating, it's almost the same thing. Not the same process of sweat, but um, it's the evaporation of extra water from a plant. Now evapotranspiration accounts for the loss of almost 100% of annual precipitation in arid areas and 75% in humid areas. So basically, um, an arid area is pretty a dry area. So the loss from evapotranspiration is 100% of that annual precipitation. So that's extremely high. Now in humid areas, it's 75% of the total, um, the total loss of the annual precipitation. So again, that's still fairly high, but humid areas have a lot more water than those arid areas. Our final component for number three, anyway, of the hydrological cycle is something called potential evapotranspiration. Again, we can av av um, abbreviate this in all caps as P period EVT. And this stands for the potential evapotranspiration. Now this is the water loss that would occur if there was an unlimited supply of water in the soil for use by that vegetation. Now I give you an example here of Egypt. So let's take a look at Egypt's actual EVT, the actual evapotranspiration from the plants is less than 250 millimeters, which is very small. It's a very tiny amount. However, if there was an unlimited supply of water that those veg that, that vegetation can use, the PEVT, the potential evapotranspiration, would be over 2,000 millimeters because we have the high temperature capable of evaporating the water. So think of Egypt in terms of its arid ability. It's very dry, very hot, meaning that it's going to evaporate any type of water really, really fast. But because they don't get a lot of rain or precipitation, its actual evapotranspiration is not going to be as high as its potential. So that potential evapotranspiration is if there was an unlimited supply.